For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2015 Memorial Day Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Friday morning, May the 22nd, 2015. Jerry McGee is the speaker of this service teaching on overcoming the sin of pride. Yes, thank the Lord for his protection. The tornado set down about 10 miles from my house. It was coming through Van. Of course, Glendale is west of Van, and it was heading west down 110. And I'm only a half a mile from 110. So I thank the Lord for the way he protects us. You know, Psalms 91 says that if we dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, we will abide under the shadow and protection of the Almighty. Hallelujah. If we make him our refuge, even the most higher habitation, no evil will befall us, nor will any plague come near our dwelling. Hallelujah. You got a plague in your dwelling? I have a plague in my dwelling. So there's some place that I wasn't under his refuge, or my forefathers, or whatever, but I'm working on it. You know, God wants us to be overcomers. We will all be overcomers because uh, he died for us at Calvary. If you're being overcome, um, you're on the wrong track. God says he defeated Satan at Calvary. In fact, he uses the devil to discipline you when you step out of line. And so it's really not a demon problem. It's a God problem. Amen. God said he's created the wicked to blow the coals. He's created the wicked for ruin. It says in Colossians, everything was created by God and for God, and there wasn't anything created by him that wasn't created for him. So, uh, it's best to walk uprightly before the Lord. Well, Lord, we just come before your throne, and we want to humble ourselves before you, Lord. We thank you and praise you that you're the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We thank you that you're the teacher, your almighty God, your commander-in-chief of all the armies of heaven. Lord, you are commander-in-chief. We thank you, Lord, that we live for you. We praise you, Lord. We glorify you. We honor you. We loose your ministering angels into this place, your mighty warring angels. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus to let there be an open heaven over this place so that each person might receive what you sent them here for. Father, I ask that I be a conduit of your mighty love, your mighty power, and your word. Let your word come forth, Lord. I ask for you to download me with your with a word that will change my life and our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you that we've been raised to sit with you in heavenly places far above principalities and powers. Lord, thank you that you created us to rule and reign in Jesus' name. Thank you that if we obey you, we're not the tail, but we're the head. We just praise you, Lord. We come under your authority. We just glorify you. We honor you. Thank you that you inhabit our praises. Lord, we thank you that the wicked bow down at our gates. Lord, we thank you and praise you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that accuses us in judgment, we condemn now in Jesus' name. We just bind and break every word of death, word of iniquity, curse, assignment, satanic ritual spoken over this place, spoken over Meryl, Barbara, uh, um, Kevin, and... and, um, Oh, Patty, <laughs> and everyone that works here, Lord, and all of the people that are here in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray a special covering of warrior angels over this place to boomerang back over the enemy, every curse and assignment that's sent against us, not to kill them, hurt them, harm them, but so they'll fear God and turn away from evil and think, how dare we curse what you blessed. And Lord, we just thank you. We ask you to cover this place with the blood of Jesus. Oh God, in Jesus' name, we bind you Satan, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, wicked spirits in the heavenly places. We bind you in the heavenly places and on this earth we forbid you to work with, communicate with, make contact with anyone on this earth or in the heavenly places to work divination against us in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that can understand so that we can turn and be healed. Lord, I loose over this place the conviction of sin, the fear of the Lord, and a spirit of repentance. Praise the Lord. Well, the title of this message is Overcoming the Greatest Sin, which is Pride. Why is pride the greatest sin? Because everything you do is I, me, mine. If I'm in fear, I'm in pride because I'm looking out for myself, right? If I'm looking at pornography, I want to satisfy my flesh. If I'm committing adultery, I'm, it's all for me. You see how all of it goes back to pride? Why does it go back to pride? Because Satan is king over all the sons of pride. Every time pride manifests in our life, Satan is king over those areas. And you know, it's better to humble yourself before God humbles you. Just like the law of gravity, wherever you're walking in pride, you will be humbled, you will be broken wherever you walk in pride. Now that's a spiritual law. Just like the law of gravity, everything that goes up will come down. And so it's best for us to humble ourselves in the mighty presence of the Lord that he might exalt us and lift us up. Pride has been my greatest sin, and I can say it's been your greatest sin, too. It's like an iceberg. You saw it off at the water's edge, and some more floats up. That's been my experience. And I hope I can get this thing to work right. I had another message I worked on, had it all um, not in bold italics. And when I opened the message about 15 minutes before this meeting started, everything was in bold italics. Well, it's hard for me to read bold italics, but I will be reading it maybe next year. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so Jesus died on Calvary to get the devil out of us. He died at Calvary, redeemed us, that he might restore us back to our place in the Garden of Eden. You know, it says when Adam had lived, well, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and you're created in the image of God, and I'm created in the image of God. And it says, but it says in uh, Genesis 5 that after Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own image and named him Seth. You see, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they received the image of the one who had uh, uh, oppressed them or tempted them in the garden. And so the purpose that Jesus died on the cross was to conform us into his image. And I've discovered that it, you don't get the devil out in one day. He comes out in increments. In fact, it's the part of the sanctification process that takes a lifetime. And so Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross was to reclaim everything the devil has stolen from us. But he, God tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In Romans 8, it says, Everything works together for good to those that love the Lord to the call according to his purpose for whom he foreknew he predestined to become conformed into the image of, of God, into the image of Christ. Now if we're wise enough to ask God when we go through circumstances, Lord, what, is your, what are you trying to teach me through this circumstance? Then we repent, uh, we change, and we get conformed more into the image of Christ. Now, if you don't ask God what he's trying to teach you, let me tell you something, you'll get bitter instead of better. And so God wants us to allow him to conform us into his image. I want to be like Jesus. We, we're not like Jesus over, overnight. I mean, at Calvary, he paid the price. Sanctification was done at Calvary, but we have to work it out. And God uses our problems to show us what he wants to work out next. Okay, suppose I have a problem and I don't work it out. Guess what? Another lap around Mount Sinai. Another lap around and spend my life never learning anything. The Bible says that a wise man will appear and increase in learning, but a fool goes on and suffers for it. So today, are you a wise person or are you a fool? I want to... I want to learn from everything that God has taken me through. Amen. And I can honestly tell you today, after having two husbands dump me, lose my son uh, with AIDS, and all that I've gone through, I can tell you it's made me a better person. And I want to be conformed more and more into the image of Christ. 
You know, God wants to change you from glory to glory. And as you change from glory to glory, you'll go from strength to strength. He doesn't want you to be sipping in sugar and watching satellite TV. He's got a plan for you. He doesn't. What a, you know, I told someone the other day that I love very much, a relative of mine. I said, you are wasting your life thinking about there's somebody in your attic trying to kill you. You're wasting your life. Are you ready to stand before the Lord and have him say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant? Are you ready to stand before the Lord and have him say, um, you missed it. You know, if you live 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, what is that compared to forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in eternity? If you live 10 more years, you've only lived 3,650 days. Now, that's not very long. Like two wash loads of clothes and it's gone. Is that right? If you live 20 years, what is that? Uh, 3,650 multiplied by two. I'm guessing 7,500 days, something like that. If you live 30 years, that's only like 10,000 and something or 11,000 more days. Are you wasting your life? You know, one reason we're afraid to die is we know we're not ready to face God in eternity. Are you ready to face God today if he would take you today? Years ago, I worked on a Billy Graham crusade, and I met Brady Wilson. And when he was growing up, his mom and dad, his mom had a plaque on the wall that said, Go no place you would not like to be going when Jesus comes. Say nothing you would not like to be saying when Jesus go, comes. Go nowhere, no place you'd not like to be found when Jesus comes. And there's a poem that I've heard that we've heard part of it, but it says, One life will soon be passed, but it's only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how glad I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for me. You see, pride causes us to live for ourselves. It's I, me, my, everything centers around, centers around I, me, and my. And it's, we sing that song, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not all about, it's all about you, Jesus, but really, the way we live our lives is all about us, and I include myself in that too. But it's getting less and less, and I want it to be less and less as I get more conformed into His image. I want to go from glory to glory and strength to strength. You know, Psalms 84 says, How blessed are those who dwell in your presence, they are ever praising you. How blessed is those whose strength is in you, whose heart is the highway to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, which is means dryness and weeping, they make it a well, a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. And so that's really a picture when you go through trials of letting God use that trial for His glory to conform you to His image. It doesn't mean He's mad at you. He may be mad at you. If you're in willful rebellion, he is, he, He's angry and you better watch out. But um, if, you, if Jesus is the King of your life and you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and body and you're as submitted to Him as you know how to be and you go through a trial, He's not mad at you. He's just trying to discipline you to correct mistakes. He's trying to align you with the Word because He wants to conform you to His image. And it's only when you're letting Him do that that He's going to bless you. And, you know, this is kind of a sidetrack, but Meryl, you're right. The things that are happening here in America. In fact, my secretary told me the other day, I was telling her that I had heard that there were some wicked people in East Texas. A friend told me that, and she said, and she wouldn't say the word over the telephone. And I couldn't figure out who she's talking about. And I said, maybe it was ISIS. And uh, my secretary said, you got something from ISIS the other day wanting to recruit you to be in ISIS. I said, I what? <laughs> They're recruiting people. But you know what? That doesn't make me afraid. I didn't even read it. I mean, I throw most of my stuff in the trash because it's advertisements and all kinds of stuff and political stuff which goes in the trash immediately. It's not that I don't care about my country. I pray for I do pray for the leaders. I do pray the one gets in. 
but uh, it seems like it's all manipulated. But it, it, I'm not afraid of any of that because I'm an ambassador of Christ. And wherever I go as an ambassador of Christ, I have diplomatic immunity. And we speak for the king. Is that right? Wherever we go, we speak for the king. And so if ISIS arrests you or whatever, hey, God cares about their soul too. Win them to the Lord. I heard a story the other day, and it's a true story, about a little lady who had memorized the book of Ephesians. And she was on some parking lot or something, and this man, who happened to be the number one rapist in the country, pulled a gun on her and said, get in your car and and put and sit on your hands, move over and sit on your hands. When she got in the car, she moved over, but when he got in, she put her hand on his shoulder, and she said, I want you to know I'm in control here. She spent about four hours leading, leading this man to the Lord. And he went to prison, and and he had prayed that before they executed him, that he could see this lady one more time. So this friend of this lady, I mean, he was asking the Lord, you know, to show him some kind of a sign. Anyway, uh, this lady's friend said, do you think you need to go see him before he's uh, he's uh, executed? And she said, oh, no, no. She's, but anyway, she didn't go in. And so we have authority over all the power of the enemy. It's just demons that control any evil people. And Lord, all over the America, there's wicked people. There's ISIS and all of that. Honestly, uh, there's certain people that are uh, proponents of the one world order. They're paying these people to do this, to cause trouble. Amen. And um, and so, Lord, we pray a hedge of thorns around them in Jesus' name. We say no weapon formed against us will prosper. If our ways please you, it makes even our enemies to be at peace with us. Thank you, Lord, that our steps are ordered by you. If we're walking in obedience, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by you, and we can't be put anywhere you don't put us. Hallelujah. I say bless the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Galatians 5.19 gives the fruit of the flesh, which is the character and nature of Satan. If I'm operating in the flesh... That's Satan's personality coming through. But the fruit of the flesh, it says if we walk by the Spirit, it says in Galatians 5.16, it gives us the fruit of the flesh, which is the character and nature of Satan. 5.16 says, but if I walk by the Spirit, if you walk by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh says it's a desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh for they're in opposition to one another so that you may not do what you please. You may not do what you please. Well, I'll say, but great, can I do what I please? No, you cannot. Galatians 5.18 says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, demons are executors of the law. You break God's law, and guess what? There's a judge, there's a demon, and there's a courtroom. I mean, there's a prison. And this is the character and nature of Satan. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. So it's not an all-conclusive list of which I forewarn you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, but I'm saved by grace. Does the word, do you want to believe the word of God? Yes, you are saved by grace. But it says if you practice those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you want to believe you had salvation and lost it, or if you want to believe you never had it, God says if you walk after the flesh, if you practice the deeds of the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, if you're like me, you've got a lot of things to work on. I don't want to walk in the flesh. Galatians 5.22 gives you the character and nature of Jesus. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Why is there no law? Because it's the personality of Jesus being manifested in me. Why is there, a, is there a law if I walk after the flesh? Because it's the personality of Satan being manifested in me. So how do we produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit? 
Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon your neck, which is a picture of coming under control of the Holy Spirit. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay. And, you, and he says, and you will enter my rest. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you live in a state of unrest? If you live in a state of unrest, then uh, you've got the wrong yoke on your neck. The yoke of Jesus produces rest. It produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Okay, the next of oh, this, this right here. Now these two clay figures got Jesus is given the invitation to come. One's got a lot of junk, and one looks pretty good, right? And so Jesus is saying, "Come unto me." Okay, the next one. Now the one with all the junk was the one that yielded, but it could have been the other way around. Uh, you know, the one that looks pretty good could be the one with the religious spirit that knows all the religious words. If you've ever seen a potter, what does the potter do? He takes out all the junk. You know, in olden days, they'd have sticks and rocks and leaves and in this clay, but nowadays the clay is kind of perfected when you buy it at the store. But that's, that's a picture of all the junk that's in our life. And you see, God doesn't look at your junk. He looks at your heart to yield. And it's his job to take the junk out. Now, what is the clay doing? Resting on the potter's wheel, right? The potter does everything. He beats the bubbles out of the clay. He fires the clay. He molds with the clay. He shakes the clay. He adds water to make the clay pliable. And if you stay on the potter's wheel, can I tell you, you will never miss what God put you here for? If you will stay yielded, don't think it's too late for your life. Don't think you just blow your life and, and you just wasted it. Moses was 80 years old when God started using him. Put him on the back side of the desert. And he was 80 years old. And so don't think you've wasted your life. If you've wasted your life, you've wasted your life. But repent. Tomorrow's a new day. Start over. Doesn't matter where you've been, but it matters where you're going. And so, um, it's the potter's job to take the clay, the junk out of the clay. It's the potter's job to clean you up. It's the potter's job to fashion you into whatever he created you to be. Now, the clay that's not yielding, he looks the, he looks the best. It could be the other way around, but I like to use the one with all the junk because when God gave me this illustration, I would look at people and I would think, you know, they think I'm, God's just gone throw them away. But God says, um, come unto me. I'll fix you. And so it's God's job to take the junk out of the clay. Um, the clay doesn't do anything but yield to the potter. The clay doesn't do anything but place his life in the hands of the potter. And that means let the potter be in control according to the word of God. Okay, there's reasons why we don't go. The next this, this is a picture of a, one, a person with a religious spirit, a legalist. The Bible says if I abide, when I'm on the potter's wheel, I'm abiding in Christ. Back that up. Back it up. When I'm on the potter's wheel and I'm abiding in Christ, 1 John 3, 6 says, whoever abides in me does not sin. Why is that? Because the only time I'm not sinning is when I'm yielded to him. Is that correct? Now, it tells me to be holy as God's holy, uh, righteous as he's righteous. Turn to the next one. And so this guy's trying to be holy, wearing himself out. Because he wants to be holy. And you know, I'm just realizing how much we all have got a religious spirit coming out of the Pharisee background. You know, a person with a religious spirit, they just deal with the outward appearance. They don't deal with the heart. The church is full of people that are, have religious spirits. They believe in Jesus with their head, but they've never been born again. And so this person, and maybe he grew up in a, uh, in a family that, that only loved him based on his performance. And so when he gets saved, he receives the lie that uh, he has to work for God. He has to work himself up into a state of righteousness so God will accept him. Years ago, uh, Probably in 1982, I was so self-righteous. Um, 
Uh, I mean, you know, probably since y'all know me, I've been abominable, but back then I was really abominable. But if I spent an hour in prayer, I would spend 45 minutes confessing sins I'd already confessed. Have you ever done that? And then I heard the, the scripture, I got a revelation, that when you confess your sins and you've really repented, means you've changed your direction, um, then um, God separates your sin as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers it no more. Well, you can fly from north to south and get there, but you can't fly from east to west and get there. And so he separated your sin as far as the east is from the west, and when I realized that, uh, that all I need to do is confess my sin and he, he remembers it no more if I'm truly repentant. And, um, and then I got this thing from, uh, Peter Lord. He taught on, uh, turkeys and eagles. I don't know if you've ever heard that teaching by Peter Lord. But basically he said if you could judge yourself between zero to ten, uh, how righteous would you say you were? And I would have said that I am a 10. Just a little pride there. Not much. <laughs> but you know what? If I said I was a 1, I still would have been self-righteous because I'd have been based it on what I did instead of on what Christ did for me at Calvary. You see, you can't do anything to earn your salvation. You, you obey because you don't want to spank it. And because you love the Lord. You know, God disciplines every son whom he loves. And if you're in sin, you're going to be disciplined. And don't wonder why you're having such bad luck or the devil's beating you up. Let me tell you something. The devil's beating you up only because God's letting him. No demon in hell can touch you unless God lets him. And the reason he's letting him, he's either trying to teach you something, he's trying to discipline you, or he's trying to wake you up. Okay, so this this represents the Pharisee or the legalist. This little guy, let's just say he just wants to do good because he's come to Christ, but he's still got thinking he has to perform for God because he had to perform growing up to get a drop of love or a drop of attention. He had to perform. Okay, and he's wearing himself out. And I want you to see that because he's not on the potter's wheel, he's in rebellion. Okay, the next one. Now this represents somebody that don't want to let go of his sin. You know, you catch a little monkey by putting a banana in the cage, and the little monkey sticks his hand in the in the cage, but he don't want to let go of the banana, so he gets captured. The Bible says a man's captured by his own sin, and that just re- represents someone that's in willful rebellion and don't want to let go, don't want to give up. I don't believe there's salvation without lordship. He's got to be the king, and he is the king. And there's going to be a lot of shocked people in eternity that's into this greasy grace thing that thinks that grace is a license to sin. It's the power of God to live for God is what it is. In fact, in in Titus, the grace of God has something to say. Somebody look up Titus 2 and read it for me, please. The first one that gets it. Titus 2. I'm guessing it's about the 15th verse or something like that. Who's got it? Titus 2. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Uh, it, it goes down to say the grace of God has appeared to all men. Where does that start? Verse 11. Verse 11. Read that, Deborah. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly love, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you see how it instructs you to live soberly, righteously in this present age? So that's what the grace of God does. It doesn't give you a license to sin. It instructs you to avoid ungodly behavior. And if you don't, you're going to get the whipping of your life. Just ask me and I'll tell you. (laughs) Okay, the next one. This represents a person that maybe grew up and he's got a demonic fear of God. 
You know, if you had parents that were rageaholics or angry people or parents that you were afraid of, it's like, God, I want to come to you, but I'm afraid of you. Or say you had a daddy that molested you or a mother that molested you, God forbid. It's like, God, I want to come, but I'm afraid of you. You see, parents model for us a picture of what God's like. Unconsciously, we believe God is just like our mother and dad. So we're, we want to go to God, but we're afraid of God. And let me tell you, you're a fainter if you do that. The only time you're not going to faint is if you go to God for answers. And He'll strengthen, establish, and perfect you if you humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. So this represents someone that is, now I want you to say this person is in rebellion because he's afraid to go to God. You know, the parable of the talents. Uh, God gave, uh, gives this parable of someone that goes on a journey, of, of a master that goes on a journey. He gives five talents to one man. He gives two to another and one to another. When he comes back, the one that had five gave him five more. The one that had two gave him two more. The one that had one gave him one more. He said, here, master, I give you back what you gave me. He said, I saw you as harsh, stiff, and stern, uh, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Because of fear, he buried his talent. And so this is just a person that's afraid to go to God. He believes in Jesus. Maybe he's been born again. Just because you believe in Jesus doesn't mean you've been born again. Amen. There has to be a heart change. I accepted the Lord five years before I was ever born again. And when I was born again, everything about me changed. And it's been a change every day. For 54, hmm. let's see, how many years? 50, 51 or 52 years, there's been a change every day. I quit cussing 52 years ago. God just took it right out of my heart. I said, Lord, a curse word came out of my mouth. I said, Lord, this doesn't sound like anything Christian ought to say. And God delivered me that day. I tell people that sometimes they say bad words. Especially if they say that S word, you know what's in your heart comes out your mouth. So this is a picture of somebody that has a demonic fear of God. The true fear of God causes me to run to God. Amen. But the demonic fear of God causes me to straight back. And it's important to go to God because if you've got a perverted God in it, that's your number one step to getting delivered because God is the only one that can fix you. And so you've got to have a correct image of God the Father. He loves you. He doesn't reject you. He's nothing like your mother and dad. And when I talk about mother and dad issues, I'm not blaming nothing on mom and dad. I'm trying to get us to take accountability for our wrong reactions to bad treatment. Okay? That one's in rebellion. Okay, the next one. This one here. Things have to get everything right before you go. That was me. I had to get everything perfect before I could go to God. Because I was taught the Lord helped those that helped themselves. How many of you were taught that? That's the biggest lie that ever came out of hell. The Lord helps those that admit they're helpless. Boy, that was a relief to me because I felt guilty because I couldn't help myself. Okay, that one's in rebellion. Legalism. Okay, under the law. The next one. This one here, beating himself up, feeling guilty. God says, if you confess your sin, and I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This clay figure represents a lot of people that have been in the occult and been satanically ritually abused. That's what they do. They burn their self with irons. They cut their hair. They eat their own feces. They do whatever they can to punish themselves. And that person's in rebellion. Okay, the next one. Or you think you have to clean yourself up. That one's in rebellion. Okay, the next one. Don't like what God's doing. You want to be a beautiful, uh, expensive vase. You don't want to be a plain old plate. Years ago, I was asking people to repent. And, okay, stand up. Ask the Lord to show you. And this one girl said, Lord, forgive me for zipping off the potter's wheel. <laughs> and that one's in rebellion. Go back to the one on the potter's wheel. There's no law there. But the others, there is a law. And see, when I, when I yield to God, I'm giving up my will, my way, my plan, my purpose. I'm saying, Lord, I'm just a clay full of mess, and you're going to have to fix me. But, Lord, here I am. I get on your potter's wheel, and I ask you, Lord, to do the work in my life. And so there's no law 
And when I yield on the potter's wheel, the character and nature of Jesus is produced in me. You say, well, you know, if God says be holy as I'm holy and be perfect as I'm perfect, well, I'm in, I, I, I've got a problem. So do I. But you know what? When when um, when we met, the potter's wheel represents an altar, and in the Old Testament, God would take a sacrifice that was imperfect. If it was lame or blind, He wouldn't take it. And but if but when the sacrifice was on the altar, when we get on the altar, then God pours out His blood. It's the pre- the precious, perfect blood of Jesus. And he looks down and he don't see all the clay full of junk. He sees his blood because we yield it. He knows we're all a work in progress. But if we keep confessing our sin, the minute you sin, confess your sin. Repentance means, you know, there's people that keep confessing the same old sin and they keep on doing it. When he shows you a sin, confess it and stop doing it. The grace is there to stop doing it. I'm thankful that when the Lord shows me something, by His grace, I stop doing it. I don't want to be that way. I've asked the Lord to show me. Lord, every time pride is kicking up in me, I want to see it. I want to humble myself. Because, Lord, I don't want you to have to humble me. Because He's going to humble us if we don't humble ourselves. So the way we produce it is to die to our life. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He said we have to give up our life that we might find it in John 12. It says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But I have to die. Paul said, I die daily. In Galatians it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not even my faith I'm living by. It's by the faith of the Son of God. So praise the Lord. And so the fruit produced when I do that is the character and nature of Jesus. And that's the only works he's going to take in Judgment Day. It's what we've done, not in the flesh. You know, I realize now, and I'm sure I... I'm still doing it in some areas, but I realize now that a lot of things I've done over the years, I've done thinking it was the Lord, but it was just in the flesh. Example, you know, I've always had a boldness, but I thought that was good because the godly are bold as a lion, but a lot of my boldness was fleshly boldness. You see? So, um, we can be so deceived. This is a true story. One day there was a president of a large real estate firm and he had a meeting with about a hundred of his employees and they had they did their business meeting and then afterwards he began to boast about that a that a inter, that a national um, business magazine had written him up for all of his accomplishments and all the things he had done to build such a great business. And I'm telling you, it made so many of these employees mad. They thought, how dare he do this because we're the ones that built his company. And he even was so arrogant to say, if you want a copy of that magazine, just ask my secretary. (laughs) Well, that same day, two of his major, uh, biggest uh, employees, number one salesman, uh, they resigned from that company and started their own company. And a bunch of the people went with them. It was just a few months after that that business was so bad that um, he didn't have enough money to close some real estate deals, and so he borrowed money out of an escrow account, which was a federal offense. And that man went to prison. All because he didn't learn the character quality of humility. Lord, let us learn that. And you know, God is... If God humbles us, it's not going to be good. But if we humble ourselves, He doesn't have to humble us. Pride is the, the scripture says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. That's in Proverbs 22, 4. Pride is the sin that God hates the most and disciplines the quickest. 
scribe caused Satan and a third of the angels to be kicked out of heaven. In Isaiah 14, he said, I will ascend above the stars of the heaven. I will sit on the mount. I'm paraphrasing. I'm leaving so that I, I, I will be like the Most High God. And God kicked him out of heaven. It's it also the cause of, of our unrepentant heart. We're too proud to humble ourselves. Pride and arrogancy and an evil way, God said, I hate. It says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble in Proverbs 13.10. Pride is putting ourselves on an equal with God. You know, when we criticize, we are really, I like what Car- Carla said last night, I don't know if I can repeat it, but about when you've got, uh, when you've got a log in your eye, the reflection, what is it you said? There? When you're looking for a place that somebody tweeted, uh, tweet, it's the reflection of your log. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but you know what? When we criticize or we judge somebody, it's because we've lifted ourselves up in pride and we're looking down at them thinking, why don't they be like me? Dear God, perish the thought. <laughs> <laughs> It's putting ourselves on an equal with God. It's taking God's glory away from Him to ourself. Um, it's reserving for ourselves the right to believe what we want to believe. Our pride is what should put Jesus on the cross. And we're just like those who said, we'll not let this man rule over us. Pride is prophesying outwardly what's not true on the inside. Definitions of pride is uh, a high opinion of myself and one's dignity, their importance, their superiority, their merit. Either taking pride in your heart or in your mind or, or by your outward behavior. It's the feeling of being proud. It is pleasure or taking pleasure or satisfaction in a person or thing bragging about it, proud, disdainful, having a high opinion of oneself with uh, some contempt of others, looking down your nose at people, being lofty and arrogant, supercilious. <laughs> well, the first time I got this, this and I, I don't do this anymore, I don't think, but maybe you think I do, I don't know. <laughs> but supercilious means dictatorial. Lofty. When I first read that, I thought, oh dear God. <laughs> Dictatorial, lofty, with pride, overbearing, dominant, dominant, with an air of contempt, manifesting pride and disdain as in a haughty air or walk. Oh God, forgive me. Now, as I name these things, be repenting, as I'm not going to go back through the list when I leave you in repentance, but be repenting. Uh, basically, pride, some other words for pride would be having to be the star of everything. And I'll just give you a few examples. The delight star, the dignity star, the happiness star, the honor star. Uh, basically, you could just put star of anything, having to be the star. Um, some some other uh, manifestations of pride are putting on airs, being uh, uh, aloof, um, and be repenting of these things because we we guilty of all of them. Having the audacity, being um, a bluster, braggadocious, um, con- uh, conceitedness, con. con- Conspicuousness, disdain, dis, uh, ego, egocentric, gall, haughty, high-minded, insolent, arrogant, rude, lofty, nerve, overbearing, pompous, presumptuous, Scornfulness, self-importance, self-love, smugness, vanity. The Bible says, 
God looks on the haughty from afar, so we wonder why God's not there, or why you don't feel his presence. He sees the haughty from afar. Proverbs 20 says, Proud, haughty, scoffer are his names who acts with insolent pride. Job 4, 41 says, speaking of Leviathan, it says his strong scales are scales of pride. He looks on everything that's high, which is haughty, arrogant, and he's king over all the sons of pride. Proverbs, uh, Psalms 83 says, those who exalt himself hate the Lord. Manifestate some more uh, manifestations of pride. And be, re- be repenting of each one of these because in some part of your life you've probably done it if you haven't your forefathers have. Amen. Pretending, shyness, is also pride because you're concerned about what people are thinking of you. Fear of man, fear of what people think. Lying, denial, covering up for others who are in sin. Religious spirit, concentrating on an outward appearance. Putting yourself down, building yourself up, nitpicking yourself, nitpicking others, living by what you think instead of what God's Word says. How many of you shared something for somebody and said, I don't believe that what I believe is da da da? You know, it don't matter what I believe or you believe, it only matters what God believes, according to His Word. Being cutting, sarcastic, critical, condemning of others. Showing partiality, being a bigot, perfectionism, performance, complaining, refuse to make it right with someone else, refuse to say you're sorry, refuse to take accountability. Something, some kind of work, some works are beneath you. Rebellion, having to be in charge or in control. Ashamed of your position in life. Shame. Think you should be doing better. If you're on the potter's wheel, it's a picture of obedience. You're doing what God tells you to do. Being a show-off. Not wanting anyone to see you. I remember in 1986, my daddy called me and told me to go down and buy me any Cadillac I wanted and he'd pay for it. And that was the most beautiful car I've ever seen. <laughs> it had gold wheels, and it had it had a blue top, and it was white bottom. It was oh my goodness, it was so beautiful. And I would go to church when Dave Wilkerson was pastor in in Van, Texas. I drive to that church, and I would park it two miles away from the church because I didn't want anybody to see it because they might reject me. See, I've come a long way. I don't care what people think anymore. <laughs> but that would have been just as prideful for me to drive up in the middle of, right in front of church for everybody to see me, but it was just as much pride for me to park two, up two miles down the road. You want to be noticed? You don't want to be noticed. Pride. You don't want to be um, noticed. Um, Saying you don't care when you really do care. I don't care. Yes, you do. (laughs) Making vows. You have to be seen uh, in the best uh, of everything. Um, Best clothes, best car, best house, best whatever. Think your way's better. Being competitive. You don't want to go with the flow. You're always trying to figure out how you can do it better or or it would be better if you did it. Thank you, Nora, than your parents knew. Boy, are y'all like me? I thought, well, I was the smartest person in the world. The older I get, the more I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, help me, Jesus. And you know, God uses your circumstances to humble you. You know, in Deuteronomy 8, it says, He took took the children of Israel in the wilderness to humble them, to prove them, to see what was in their heart. Well, he already knew what was in their heart. But you know what? When you have a problem like the problem that I've had with my eyes, I'm here to tell you, you see a lot of stuff you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Anytime. I'm sure Patty could tell you that. I'm sure anybody that's gone through any kind of a trial in their life 
if they really love God, they're going to learn from that trial and they're going to see sin. I've seen sin in my life that I would have never known was there. Ever. I've continued being haughty and arrogant and insolent and rude and everything else. So we can thank God. That's how. That's why you can count it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing endurance and you have need of endurance. And it says after you've done the will of God, you'll receive what's promised. For it's those who endure to the end will be saved, is what it says in the Bible. And Lord, I thank you that your grace will help us endure. Doing what seems best to you. Not being considerate of others. Think you're too good. Look down your nose at people. Others are beneath you. Not giving credit where credit's due. Hard heart. You know, and I say something for the ministers here. I thank God because we're not working for our own ministry. We're working for the kingdom. And, and it's like every part has a part. God doesn't want everybody to be, you know, he gives the illustration, not an illustration, but in Corinthians where it says, if we're all ears, if we're all eyes, if we're all legs, if we're all this, we're all that, it'd be pretty freaky. Wouldn't it? And God doesn't want you to be like anybody but who he created you to be on the potter's wheel because then he'll fix you. You don't have to compare yourself. God says if you compare yourself among yourself and measure yourself by yourself, you're a fool. And it says there's more hope for a fool than a man is wise in his own eyes. And I thank God for his mercy on me. <laughs> You're hard-headed. You have a hard heart. You retreat into isolation or silence. Always have an answer for everybody. Refuse to receive advice or deliverance. Refuse to receive deliverance. Can't let others know that you have a problem. Have to do it yourself. Want others to think you're perfect or that you don't have a problem. Refuse to be vulnerable. Refuse to be transparent. Refuse certain friendships. I can't believe so-and-so did this. Well, I would never. Guess what? Like Carla said, you better watch out. <laughs> I don't need anyone. I, I... You know, my dad used to say, they need me worse than I need them. You understand where that independent spirit came in? <laughs> I mean, all the family members that, you know, never called him or never, you know, they need, they need me worse than I need them. <laughs> I never had that attitude, but I tell you, I got that independent spirit and it got God's diminishing it. And I'm having to depend on people to, uh, at the moment, drive me like Hamilton. <laughs> it's teaching me to, it's breaking, it's breaking the independent spirit. I do it better. I'll do it. I'll show you. Just let me do it. Trusting yourself. Rationalizing. Justifying. Turning to yourself for protection. Self-idolatry. You're trying to protect yourself, defeating, defending yourself, uh, overly loud or overly quiet. You know, I, I used to be more loud than I am now, and so Kyle is very quiet. <laughs> you know, it's like you do just the opposite of what you, sometimes you think your mother's a loud mouth, he never said that. I'm just thinking he might have thought that. <laughs> Married a real quiet woman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was funny. Uh, I took the kids one time. I babysat the kids, and they lived in uh, Wyoming. And so I babysat the kids, and I took them to Montana. And we had a fun day. We ate out, and we swam at the swimming pool, and all this kind of stuff. So coming home in in Montana, there's no street signs. There's no nothing. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you know, and so we drove and drove and drove, and I said, girls, I think we missed our turn, but we're probably only 50 miles out of the way. <laughs> we probably only missed our, you know, 50 miles out of the way. So we finally come to this town, finally, and uh, I said, how far is Wyoming? And she said, oh, about five hours away. I said, dear God in heaven, help me, Jesus. Well, one of my granddaughters started laughing, 
And the other one started crying. I said, oh, Holly, shut up. <laughs> anyway, she went home and told her mother and daddy, Kyle and his wife, did you know that grandmother cursed? <laughs> she said, what did, what did she say? She said, shut up. <laughs> and I, I just now found that out after all these years. My grandmother was a cusser. I tried so hard to be an example to her, but I cursed. Grandmother said, shut up. <laughs> and so, and I found out they weren't allowed to say that word. Well, you know, I grew up hearing that word, so I didn't say anything of it. Anyway, so grandmother quit cursing. <laughs> talking too much about yourself, excessive talking. Have you ever been around someone that just never shuts up and you think, dear God in heaven, get away from that person? Yeah. Excessive talking, being argumentative, yeah. um, bragging, want to be honored, feel insecure with what you know, so you try to, try to create a doctrine uh, to prove that it's either right or wrong. You have to prove it, you prove yourself. Um, you're accusing others, you fight to stay on top, and you have to be the top dog. And you can just add others to that. But all those are manifestations of pride. It, it goes back to I, me, mine. It says in, in, uh, that there's a throne of grace we can go to, and it's really the potter's will. And for me to go there, I have to humble myself. It says in Habakkuk 4, 16, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. That's not Habakkuk, that's Hebrew. Hebrews 4, 16. Confident to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and help and find grace to help in time of need. And so that's the key to overcoming is going to the throne of grace and getting God's mercy, getting his wisdom, getting his strategy. James 4, 6 says, He gives a greater grace, therefore God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You ever wonder why things are not being more successful than you think it ought to be? Because of your pride. Our pride. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in the proper time. It says, Humble yourself. Humble yourself. He's, a, he's able to humble those that are proud. Proverbs 29.2 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. And you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. He was out on his balcony just saying, Oh, this great kingdom that I myself have built. And then the prophecy came, and before you knew it, he said, "This king, The kingdom, God said, The kingdom's going to be taken from you. He went out. And he was uh, out in the wilderness with, with bird claws. And, um, and and this is what he said after that wilderness experience where God humbled him. It says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the king of heaven, for all his works are just, and his ways all of his, I'm sorry, all of his works are true and all of his ways are just and he's able to humble all those who walk in pride. And he probably could have said, just ask me, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, Isaiah 2 says, the pride of man will be humbled. Job 40, verse 12 says, he looks on everyone who's proud and humbles him <laughs> Matthew 23 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Pride and unbelief go together. Habakkuk 2 4. Pride will bring about your destruction. Proverbs 18 12 says, Before destruction of the man, of the heart of a man is, hum, is haughty, but, but the humble. But humility goes before honor. Jeremiah 50, verse 29, it says, Summon against Babylon all those who bend the bow and camp against on every side. And of course, Babylon represents the 
church member that lives after the flesh. We think it's the Catholic Church, and it is, but it's the Methodist, the Presbyterian, it's, it's any church that doesn't teach people to be disciples, that doesn't make disciples. It teaches, it teaches people to live after the flesh. It's that greasy grace teaching. Malachi 4, 1 says, For behold, the day of the Lord is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be shacked. In Second Chronicles 17, um, see, and he took great pride in the ways of the Lord, and God removed the high places. But it's talking about, um, let's see, something got erased here. Anyway, Hezekiah got into pride, and it says he, in Second Chronicles 32:26. Hezekiah humbled himself and then God healed him. Pride blocks our prayers, Job 35, 12. There they cry out, but he does not hear, and because of the pride of men. First Chronicles 33, 1, that he may turn aside a man from pride. It says, while he sleeps, he opens his ears and delivers him from pride. Pride is the root of taking advantage of the of the afflicted. Psalms ten. Pride is the root of lying lips. Psalms thirty one eighteen. Pride is the root of foot and leg problems. Psalms twenty thirty six eleven says, Let the foot of pride come upon me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. Pride is the root of mouth problems. We know that. Pride is the root of neck problems. It says in Ezekiel 7.20 that people exchange God's ornaments for ornaments of pride. In Proverbs 1.8 it says, Hear my son your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, it's a graceful wreath about your head and ornaments about your neck. But then it says in Ezekiel that because of pride we exchange God's ornaments for ornaments of pride. And then we get another necklace, Psalm 73. Therefore, pride is a necklace. The, the garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges with fatness, which is one of the roots of glaucoma. Pride is the root of <coughs> dishonor, Proverbs 11.2. Pride is the root of stumbling. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 16.18. Pride is the root of being a scoffer, double-mindedness. Pride takes you captive. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 13, 1 says, But if you will not listen to it, my soul will sob in secret for such pride, and my eyes will bitterly weep and fall down with tears. Why? Because the flock of the Lord has been taken captive. (coughs) Pride brings about Destruction upon you and your children. Ezekiel 24, 2, 21. <coughs> Speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm about to profane my sanctuary. Break down the pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, and the desire of your soul, and your sons and your daughters, whom you have left behind, will fall by the sword. Pride brings about desolation. That's Ezekiel 23:28. Pride proceeds from an evil heart. Mark 7, 21. From, from far from within, the heart proceeds the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, um, wickedness, deceit, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. The prideful wander from his commandments. Psalms 119.2 Thou dost rebuke the arrogant, the curse that wander from your commandments. Pride is the characteristics of a fool. I'm leaving some of this out. There's so many. Proverbs 14 says a wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool 
is arrogant and careless. Pride is the root of eye problems. First John 2 talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. We sin with our eyes. Numbers 12 says Moses was the most humble man that lived upon the earth. His eye was not him, nor was his strength abated. Proverbs 21, 4 says, Haughty eyes, God will abase. Isaiah 5, 1, 15 says, The eyes of the proud will be abased. Psalms 18, 2, For thou didst save an afflicted people, but the eyes of the haughty thou didst abase. Pride is the root of, root of stri- strife and contention. <coughs> if love is not arrogant, hate is arrogant. 1 Corinthians 13. Pride is the root of being cut off. It's the root of heart problems. Psalm 69:32. The humble have seated and are glad, but you who seek the seek God, let your heart revive. Praise God. Pride causes us to lose our position and be dis- disposed from our throne. God tells us to take a lowly seat. King Hezekiah, because he went into the temple in pride and, and started to do the uh, duties of the priest, God struck him with leprosy. And he lived the rest of his life as a leper because of pride. Anyway, there's, we just need to humble ourselves. Amen. Amen. Stand up and ask the Lord to, my husband always said, say, please stand up. <laughs> there's that dictatorial thing. Okay, would you please stand up? <laughs> Lord, in Jesus' name, I've been very proud and haughty. And all my sin goes back to pride. And I want to conquer this greatest sin through humbling myself. And Lord, I do humble myself now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I yield myself to you. And I humble myself. And I ask you, Lord, from this day forward that any time I start to be prideful, or manifest pride that you will remind me to humble myself. Lord, show me my blind spots. You know, I can see your blind spots. You can see my blind spots. And so, Lord, we have blind spots that we want you to show us. And I just ask you to do that, Lord. Lord, I ask for the truth that sets me free. And just... Repent of whatever the Lord shows you and then sit down and then we'll do deliverance. Father, I humble myself before you. And Lord, forgive me for everything you've shown me. Forgive me for self-righteousness, insolence, arrogance, rudeness. Lord, forgive me for meanness. Forgive me for I, me, my. Everything centers around me. God, in Jesus' name, forgive me for putting on airs, being braggadocious, for bragging, for boasting. Forgive me that I have to be the star. I have to be the center of attention. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. God, forgive me for being competitive, conceited, disdainful, um, egotistic, greedy. God, forgive me for being haughty, and arrogant and prideful. Forgive me for not taking a low, lowly seat. God, forgive me for being ha- being lofty, having a lofty attitude, being nervy, overbearing, uh, presumptuous. Oh God, forgive me for being self-reliant, having self-importance being independent, having self-love. Forgive me that, that it's all about me instead of being all about you. God, forgive me for being supercilious, being vain, haughty, proud, scoffer. Forgive me for hating you, Lord. 
Forgive me for pretending, being in denial, lying, cheating, stealing, looking at pornography, being in a sexual sin. Forgive me for rebellion. Forgive me for having a religious spirit, covering up for others. God, I ask you to forgive me for putting other people down, nitpicking myself, nitpicking others, living by what I think, reserving for myself the right to believe what I want to believe. God, forgive me for being critical and controlling, conniving, perfectionism. Forgive me for thinking I have to turn the potter's wheel. Lord, I live, I, I yield my life to you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name, in obedience to you. You know, if I say obedience, immediately you think about turning the potter's wheel. But if you've ever been arrested, and at one time I pastored a church where everybody in there had been arrested, I think. <laughs> but anyway, but when you're arrested, what you do? You, you put your hands up. You, you obey, but it, it, it implies surrender. So, Lord, I surrender to you. And I repent of trying to turn the potter's wheel. I forgive my parents that I was afraid of them, which has caused me to be afraid of you. Father, forgive me for trying to fix myself and trying to do it myself, uh, thinking I have to be perfect before I can come to you. Forgive me for thinking that I have to clean myself up. Lord, that's your job. And Lord, I've got clay full of junk. But Lord, I want to please you. So I yield to you. And I give you permission to do with me whatever you want to do with me. All I ask, Lord, is that when I leave this earth, you'll be able to say to me, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I praise you, Lord. Lord, forgive me for refusing and rebellion and unbelief and doubt. Forgive me for being a know-it-all. Forgive me for being a Pharisee. Forgive me for having a religious spirit, an antichrist spirit. Forgive me for having to be in charge or in control. Having to be the star, superstar, being a show-off. Forgive me for wanting to be noticed or not wanting to be noticed. Forgive me for timidity, shyness. Forgive me for being too loud and too quiet and talking all the time. God, forgive me for um, saying I don't care when I do. I break vows I made. God, forgive me for thinking that my way is better. Forgive me for being um, not wanting to go with the flow. Forgive me for being stubborn and obstinate and refusing to yield to you. Forgive me for not being considerate of others, thinking that I know better, thinking that my way is best, that others are beneath me. Forgive me for being prejudiced and bigoted and being a bigot. Forgive me for having a hard heart. Forgive me for retaliate, retaliating, contention, strife, refusing to listen. God, forgive me for always thinking I have the answer, being wise in my own eyes. I can't let others know I have a problem. Forgive me for pride, having to do it myself. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for refusing to be vulnerable and transparent and for, for using re- friendships that you want me to have. Forgive me for being uh, an overachiever uh, at a prime. Um, thinking I have to excel when Lord all you want me to do is yield to you. Rest on the Father's will. <clears throat> Trusting myself, Lord, forgive me. For rationalizing, justifying, uh, trying to protect myself, not and having a perverted image of you based on how I've seen my mother and dad. Forgive me for zipping off the potter's wheel. Forgive me for being afraid of you. Overly, God, forgive me for uh, being argumentative, boasting, wanting to be honored, feeling like um, my way is best. Forgive me for accusing others, fighting to stay on top, having to be the top dog. God, you said you give grace to the humble, and I humble myself before you. In the name of Jesus, I bind the strong man over every person's life. I bind you, Leviathan, Python, Jezebel, and Christ, Dagon. I bind every spirit that would not confess Jesus Christ as Lord. 
I bind all Pharisee demons, all religious spirits in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I bind you up. I seal you by the blood of Jesus, and I command the spirit of pride to go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I break the power of arrogance. I command you to go. Haughty spirit, come out now. Rebellion, come out. Antichrist, come out. In Jesus' name, every lying spirit that my way is best, I say get out in Jesus' name. All spirits of high-mindedness and haughtiness, leave now. All the demons in our eyes, get out now. I take off the pride necklace in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I break your power over every life in Jesus' name. Just blow it out. Cough out in Jesus' name. I break the power of anger, bitterness, resentment, hatred, go, depression, discouragement. You have to leave. In Jesus' name, I break your power. In the mighty name of Jesus, I command you out. All spirits of, of perfectionism, performance, every lie that I have to do everything perfect to be loved. Get out now in Jesus' name. I break your power in Jesus' name. Praise you, mighty God. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Just release them. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I break the power of Leviathan. I say you no longer will be king over their lives. Come out now. Leviathan, I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. Go in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. Hatred, meanness, go in Jesus' name. Praise you, mighty God. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. All spirits of striving, contention, and strife, get out now in Jesus' name. All spirits of argumentativeness, go in Jesus' name. All spirits of judgmentalness and criticism, Go, all spirits of unbelief and doubt, lies and lies, get out now in Jesus' name. We break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. Go, go, all spirits of shyness, timidity, go in Jesus' name. Loudness, quietness, go in Jesus' name. All spirits of unrest, go in the name of Jesus. I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Lord, I take a lowly seat. Bless you, Lord. When you feel a release, lift your hands and sing with me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's stop a minute. There's a lot of people not putting your hands up, so if that means you didn't get delivered, stop right now and ask the Lord, why didn't you get delivered? Ask the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Stubbornness, rebellion. Go in Jesus' name. I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Now put your hands up if you got delivered. Lord, I thank you and praise you. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Lord, fill me with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you to bless the food. We ask you to purify it, sanctify it. Thank you for it. Thank you for Rick. Thank you for all the people that are cooking. Thank you for Patty and Kevin. Lord, thank you for Linda, Merrill, Barbara. Oh, God, thank you for Crystal and Dan. Thank you for every person at this camp, Lord, every person that's helping. In Jesus' name, praise you, mighty God. Glenn always wanted everybody to go to the very end. He did. Go to the very end. When you go to the dining hall, because that way you don't stop up the flow. <laughs> God bless you. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.